Welcome to our presentation on the voice of the lecturer, image word relations in optical lantern and early film performances. Since the 1990s, the film lecturer, who had received little scholarly attention earlier, has become an object of study for film historians working on the sonic dimension of early film shows. The lecturer was indeed an important element of an art often characterized as essentially silent. The practice of lecturing, in turn, is commonly considered to have its roots in magic lantern shows, which generally were presented by someone standing next to the screen, often with a pointing stick, and commenting on the projected images. From a media historical perspective, both the emerging medium of cinema and the historical art of projection are part of the history of screen practice. As Martin Leuperdinger states, When it was introduced, cinematograph shows and lantern shows shared the screen. Furthermore, lantern and cinematograph shows shared sound, live music, imitations of noises and comments spoken by the lecturer or film narrator. Despite obvious similarities between lantern and film lecturers, Several authors have pointed out significant differences. Richard Krenkel, in particular, critiqued the fact that Scholars of the early moving picture have tended to take for granted its formal and practical relationship with the magic lantern. Acknowledging the similarities between both, he also lists four fundamental differences. First, lantern lecturers commented on a series of projected images that could be highly diverse, whereas a film presented continuous pictures whose sequential logic did not necessarily depend on the accompanying commentary. Second, lantern lectures were mostly pre-scripted, sometimes in the form of a lantern reading provided by the producer or distributor, whereas comments on films seem to have been generally improvised. Third, Lantern lecturers rather gave an educative explanation of the views, while moving pictures generally were presented as spectacle. And fourth, presentation context and audiences differed. Lecture halls, auditoriums, public meeting rooms, etc. for the lantern, while films were predominantly shown in variety of vaudeville theatres, fairgrounds and later in movie theatres. One could add that while the lantern lecturer stays in command as to when a new slide is projected, the moving picture lecturer has to adapt the length of the comments to the length of the scenes and the film as a whole, and cannot elaborate at will on a particular aspect. In analogy with Philippe Marion's distinction between temporalities of media reception, one could characterize the relation between a film and a comment as homochronic, meaning that the comment ideally runs in parallel with the scenes or shots. In a lantern performance, this relation is heterochronic insofar as the time span during which an image is projected is not predetermined by the technology. Now we come to our next part, the figure of the lecturer. It is important to understand that the term lecturer in contemporary sources is not a homogeneous concept. A spectacle by Professor Koenig in 1893 was advertised as follows. With lecture, music and songs, introducing original effects, village blacksmiths, wrecked and rescued, Vesuvius, Flying Dutchman, Niagara, Switzerland, charming scenery of the Seines, the Four Seasons with grand effects, concluding with refined comic and amusing subjects. This show was obviously different from the nine popular lectures on travel subjects announced by the Beverly Photo Society in the same issue of the Optical Magic Lantern Journal, or a lecture given by someone who depended heavily on the printed reading accompanying a slide set. Similarly, Lecturing practices for early film projections differed in accordance with the performance context. As Martin Barnier points out, lecturers in cinemas who knew their audience 
were not in the same position as their fairground counterparts. Also, lecturers in a neighborhood cinema and those performing in a high-class establishment addressed their audiences differently. Lecturers in a tent on a fairground admitting 200 spectators did not work under the same conditions as those in establishments with 10 times this seating capacity. Films presented as part of a music hall, vaudeville or variety theatre programme demanded yet another type of presentation. The travelling showwoman, Madame Olinka, for instance, had the habit of presenting each film from the stage of the theatre as it was shown, describing the images in stentorian tones that one reporter found very original and strange. The individuality of Madame Olinka's voice thus became an important feature of her cinematographic pictures act. Our next section is on the temporal relations between word and image. The default option for lecturing on both slides and film undoubtedly was to comment on the images while they were projected, yet other options were available. One lecturer, for instance, explained, I have sometimes found it answer well with, when lecturing on certain subjects to give the lecture proper first, either from a complete manuscript or from notes, and then to turn down the gas in the room and show the slides on the screen as illustrations of what has been already said, with a few words about each picture pointing out what is especially noteworthy. Thus the audience gain first a general idea of the subject and then, when they know the outlines, will more fully understand the details when they are pointed out. G. Michel Coissac compared this way of lecturing to a publisher putting all the illustrations at the end of a book. He is critical of this approach because then the lecturer has to once more summarize the lecture and thus make it longer, but not more interesting. Coissac compares lecturing while the images are projected to illustrations integ integrated into the text of a book. This he deems efficient, as the spectators listen to the comments while looking at the screen. But because of the darkness in the hall, the audience cannot see the gestures and facial expressions of the speaker while the latter cannot observe the spectator's reactions. Therefore, Cossack favors a third mode, which however depends on the possibility to easily dim the lights or switch them on and off. The lecturer can thus present a section of the talk, then have a series of slides projected to illustrate the matter while giving additional comments, resume the lecture etc. These reflections indicate that in cases other than the default option of a simultaneous presentation, the relation between the projected image and the verbal discourse could have several dimensions. The lecture as such could gain a certain autonomy with respect to the pictures, which in turn played a role other than simple illustrations, as they could form units of their own that were related to but not entirely integrated into the oral performance. In a 1911 article in Cine Journal, Cossack addressed the issue of moving pictures as part of a lecture. He writes that film still has stayed some kind of distraction and curiosity, and therefore it would be vain to talk while animated pictures are being projected. All attention is claimed by them. And he adds, Moreover, it seems that these use chop off the syllables of the words one could like to apply to them. For Kossack, thus the attractional qualities of film is so powerful that a comment would not have much effect. His second remark refers to the homochronic relation between the projected image and the words and suggests that a comment cannot be developed sufficiently while the moving picture is on the screen. By using the term conference, lecture, here, 
Cosette does not refer to commenting on a film in a movie theater. Yet, his suggestions do not concern exclusively educational lectures. For narrative films too, Cossack deems it preferable to let the moving pictures, as he puts it, speak for themselves. He states, Perfection consists in knowing how to use still and moving projections in combination. While the former are integrated as illustrations into the text, as part of an uninterrupted narrative, the latter are like plates published in a separate section of a book, speaking for themselves, while the lecturer as well as the audience can catch their breath. There are topics that the cinematograph can cover entirely and thus facilitate the lecturer's task, such as the cinematographic and lyrical story of Joan of Arc, which can be preceded by a lecture, then with recitatives and chants the cinematograph will constitute the second part. Quasac thus attributes to the cinematographic views the capacity to not only speak for themselves, but also to cover entirely the topic at hand. Yet they are shown in combination with a lecture preceding them. They are not illustrating the lecture, but are framed by it, and the lecturer still holds the interpretive authority. We finish our talk with some remarks on the lecture soundscapes. The lecturer's voice was not the only type of sound accompanying projected images. Martin Barnier has mapped the soundscape of early film screenings with its variety of sonic practices. Lantern projections too took place in a multi-layered sound environment. As one author remarked, Many lecturers do not scruple to fire off pistols on the platform as a means of giving additional force to dioramic effects, such as the blowing up of steamboats, firing cannons and the like. The use of sonic elements, however, always depended on the specific context of the performance. The same goes for the lecturer, who was a protein figure indeed. Only when trying to understand performance practices in their specific manifestations can we begin to realize the richness of media use and the multiple ways in which audiences encountered them. Thank you for your attention.